Good morning and welcome to Mount Carmel on this Reformation Sunday. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear God, we gather on this last Sunday in October to celebrate Reformation Sunday. We come in gratitude for your everlasting and bountiful love. Let us hear your word that it may encourage us and strengthen us. We ask for your continued protection in a world fraught with dangers and turmoil. As we witness the struggles of those in the Middle East, we ask that you plant the seeds of hope and understanding that may lead to a lasting peace. We thank you for the beauty of this fall season, this exceptional weather, the bounty of the harvest, the colorful display of nature. Bless us throughout the week ahead that we in turn may be a blessing to to others. We pray all of this in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Our opening hymn, is found on page 176, Majesty, Worship His Majesty. Please stand and then remain standing for the Apostles' Creed. Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, who is our comfort and strength in every situation, we pray today for those who are lonely and facing life's trials by themselves. For those in hospitals and nursing homes, for widows and widowers, for orphans and runaway children who yearn for the companionship of family. We pray for those who are dying, the, dying the lonely death of COVID, those fighting in and victims of war and their loved ones, hear our prayers for all people who feel cut off from the fellowship they need. Help them to know union with you and unity with your church so that even in their most desperate trials, no one need be an island in a stormy sea and no one need walk in the valley alone. Most gracious and glorious God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, is a divine gift of our reconciliation. We also pray today for the unity of the church everywhere in the world. Make the day soon come when there is really no Jew or Greek among your people, but different persons made one in Christ. Bless us with the coming of Jesus to be the bond which unites us and who shatters the barriers which segregate us. Make the day soon come, great God, when your church everywhere has one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and we are a beacon of hope and unity in a troubled and divided world. We pray through Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, for thou art, and the glory forever. Amen. Next week, you will dedicate these, these shoe boxes and they're a part of the important ministry and outreach that, that we participate in with other organizations other than United Methodist. But we do want to say thank you not only for today uh, and, and the offering that, you'll, uh, that you've already shared with us, but what you'll do in the coming days and the people's lives that you'll touch. The children, the children who need so much they need family. They need support. One of the things that continues to haunt me, I shouldn't say haunt me, make me smile, I guess, is that um, sh short tape that I played a couple of years ago of the children reacting to receiving the shoes that you threw out. So happy, so pleased to have something to put on. It may make the difference in whether they can walk to school if it's cold weather. It may make the difference whether or not they've got to wear shoes that are hand me down to the third piece. Now, some of you in this room may remember that in your own lives, uh, that you were what somebody else provided, and you knew how important it was to you. We thank you for that. We thank you for your support. And we dedicate it all to God's work. Let's receive the morning offering. to the Holy One. Give thanks because he 
praise give him Jesus Christ his son and now let the weak say I am strong let the poor say Indeed, we do give thanks, O Lord, for all you've done for us, and we do it with presenting a portion of, you, of what you've given us back to you. We're grateful for your grace and your love for us. Accept these gifts. Consecrate them. May they be comfort for others, food for the hungry, medicine for the sick. In all of it, Lord, we give you thanks and praise that you have given us so much that we can spare to be generous. In Christ's name, amen. reading this morning is Romans 15 verses 1 through 9a. Those of us who are strong and able in the faith need to step in and lend a hand to those who falter and not just do what is most convenient for us. Strength is for service, not status. Each one of us needs to look after the good of the people around us, asking ourselves, how can I help? That's exactly what Jesus did. He didn't make it easy for himself by avoiding people's troubles, but waded right in and helped out. I took on the troubles of the troubled, is the way scripture puts it. Even if it was written in scripture long ago, you can be sure it's written for us. God wants the combination of his steady, constant calling and warm personal counsel in scripture to come to characterize us, keeping us alert for whatever he will do next. May your dependability, steady, and warm personal God develop maturity in you so that you get along with each other as well as Jesus gets along with us all. Then we'll be a choir, not our voices only, but our very lives, singing in harmony in a stunning anthem to God and Father of our Master, Jesus. So reach out and welcome one another to God's glory. Jesus did it, now you do it. Jesus, staying true to God's purposes, reached out in a special way to the Jewish insiders so that the old ancestral promises would come true for them. As a result, 
the non-Jewish outsiders have been able to experience mercy and to show appreciation to God. This ends our reading. Let's pray. Now pour your spirit on us, O God. That as we hear your word proclaimed and expounded on, we may find hope, inspiration, and direction for our lives. Move in us, move in the preacher. Help us to open our hearts to you. And may the words we hear be your word and not the words of any man. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Reformation Sunday celebrates monk Martin Luther's call for a dialogue over what he identified as corruption in the ranks of the church, particularly church authorities, over the selling of indulgences. Now, Marilyn suggested they were one thing. Let me suggest a little more different image for you. Indulgences were like get out of jail free cards. And you could buy them, just like you could buy them from a competitor in Monopoly. But Luther's more significant concern was the corruption and abuse of power in the church by the church authorities, which created a split between the clergy and the peasants. It began in Wittenberg, Germany, 506 years ago, and primarily sparked the Lutheran and Calvinist movements. Though we recognize the event, and we give it homage, it's not for us. It's not the root of our churches. Our denomination has its roots in the English Reformation. Now the English Reformation also in the 16th century, was a 16th century event. While the church, while well, the Catholic Church of England also had its corruption issues, the Church of England, or the current church, which we know as the Episcopal Church, did not have such a laudable beginning. The Church of England was formed when Pope Clement VII refused to annul King Henry VIII's marriage to Catherine of Argonne. He had several wives. I remember, uh, you remember an old song from the 50s or 60s, I'm Henry VIII, I am. Yeah. He's been married seven times before. Well, it wasn't quite seven, but it's close. Catherine of Argonne, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, Catherine of Howard, and finally, Catherine Parr, who really outlived him. Luther never wanted to break away from the Catholic Church. His 95 Theses was a series of questions inviting others to a dialogue. But the church was threatened. The leadership was threatened. And like most power structures, under threat, they used their position to preserve their power. And that unleashed movements across Europe which collectively became the Protestant movement. Now the result of the Protestant movement in that development was the founding of the Lutheran Church, the Baptist Church, the Anabaptist movement, the Calvinist, the Presbyterian, and the Congregational churches. These movements sought a less corrupt, more spiritual way to serve Christ instead of the corrupt church hierarchy that emphasized their preservation these movements, including our movement of Methodism in England, sought to live out the gospel through the reforms they felt were needed. So by 1650, and probably long before, church hierarchy became less concerned about spreading the invitation for people to become the body of Christ with a heart for others, and more about the preservation of the wealth of the church, its leaders, and the aristocrats that formed the government. Now, it occurs to me that much of Paul's theology and writing encourages the body of Christ to find ways to live together despite differences. In today's text, 
Paul's appeal to the church in all ages is to live out the faith even when it's inconvenient. As we hear about the church in Rome, we know many things that need to be addressed, even in the foundational years of the body of Christ. Our text is a plea for inclusion and cooperation and direction for unity. It elaborates on the pleas we recognized last week. Here, Paul once again calls for compassion and community building as a vital strategy for furthering the mission of the church. He calls for people to care for each other, paying particular attention to those new in the faith. He calls for a kind of mentoring model of discipleship development. Remember, the purpose of the church is not to preserve itself, entertain its members, or even feed and care for others. Those activities are foundational to who we are and how we live out our faith. Our calling, our purpose as a church of Jesus Christ is to make disciples. To get out of this building. To help people understand the life that they can have. We're called to make disciples. The strong and able in faith. Stepping in and lending a hand to those who falter to assist the tender foots in the faith is vital to growing the body of Christ. In verse 2, Paul indicates that each one of us needs to look at the good of the people around us, asking ourselves, how can I help? Now, there's a connection in the body of Christ, a connectedness, which Paul references often. We studied it in Romans 7 and 12 throughout this sermon series. And he uses the same metaphor again in 1 Corinthians 5 and 6, 10 and chapter 12, and all the chapters, all five chapters of Ephesians and in Colossians 1, 2, and 3. It is essential that followers of Christ not tear each other apart, as has happened so often in church history. It was difficult when Luther posted his invitation to dialogue on the door of the Wittenberg church because church leadership felt accused and threatened. Luther was excommunicated, but he wasn't alone. John Wycliffe, after his death, was declared a heretic in the 14th century because the Catholic Church found his teaching and his translation of the Bible into English offensive. The most radical result of his work was with the translation of the Bible. Anyone who could read now had access to the Word of God. Do you understand the implication of that? All the interpretation of scripture came through the priest or the monks. You didn't probably read Latin or Greek or Hebrew. But when the Bible was translated into English, it gave everybody an opportunity to know what it said. And it also gave everybody an opportunity not to understand what it said. And John Haas. John Huss was a Czech priest and a reformer who, ex who was excommunicated and burned at the stake for heresy because he called for reform and publicly criticized the corruption of the church. French theologian John, uh, John Calvin disagreed with the church, was excommunicated and ultimately established the reformed tradition that resulted in the establishment of the Presbyterian reform that now UCC churches. Paul calls us who are firm in the faith to step in and lend a hand to those who are weaker. The focus of our life together is growing disciples and walking with those who need assistance in their faith journey. Further, he says this is not an if you have time or if you feel like an activity. He recognizes that helping others grow in their faith means walking with them in their journey. Now, in many circles, it's called discipling. Paul's call to the young Christian church is to reflect Jesus 
And in this instance, the direction is strong. Mature people of faith need to step up to the plate and lend a hand to those struggling with their faith. In, in other words, to look after the good of the people around them, asking, how can we help? Admittedly, living together as brothers and sisters in Christ is not easy. A man named Stephen was walking along a road one night. He was out near a bridge when he, which crosses a river on the outskirts of town. As he approached the bridge, though, he saw a man standing as if he were ready to jump off. It was a long way down the river. Jumping would mean certain death. Stephen decided he would try to stop the suicide. He figured out that if, he, if they started talking and found something in common, the other man might decide he wanted to live. So Stephen said, tell me something. Are you a religious man? Yes, I am, the man said. Good, Stephen said. So am I. Are you of the Christian religion, Jewish religion, or perhaps some other, asked Stephen. I'm of the Christian religion, the man said. Good, said Stephen. So am I. Are you a Protestant Christian or a Catholic Christian? The man answered, I'm a Protestant Christian. Good, said Stephen. So am I. Do you belong to the Methodist wing of the Protestant Christian church, the Baptist wing, or some other? I belong to the Baptist wing of the Protestant Christian church, replied the man on the bridge. Good, said Stephen. So am I. Now, are you Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? I'm Northern Baptist, the man said. Good, said Stephen. So am I. Now, are you an independent Northern Baptist or a denominational Northern Baptist? I am a denominational Northern Baptist, the man said. And Stephen said, good, so am I. Are you a fundamentalist denominational Northern Baptist or a liberal denominational Northern Baptist? The man said, I'm a liberal denominational Northern Baptist. Good, said Stephen, so am I. As a liberal denominational Northern Baptist, which creed do you subscribe to? The New Hampshire Confession of 1833 or the Abstract of Principles of 1859? Why, I subscribe to the New Hampshire Confession of 1833. Die, you heretic, cried Stephen, and pushed him the man off the bridge. <laughs> now, this is a terrible story. <laughs> It's a terrible story, but it makes a point. We sometimes get so definite and get down to the detail that we get lost in the details. You know, kind of somebody seeing, not being able to see the forest for the trees. As the church in Paul's day lost its focus on its divisions, with its divisions, are we any better? Almost every denomination's in turmoil and experiencing churches leaving, or as we call it, it's kind of nicer, I guess, isn't it? Disaffiliation. The issues are varied. Some leave over issues such as the handling of sexual abuse, the inclusion of the LGBTQ population, and politics. The result is that younger and older generations seeking a spiritual connection reject the church of Jesus Christ. In the late 60s and early 70s, it was over anti-war and racial inclusion. The worship wars of the 90 were over the style of music, and today it's questions of inclusion, gun violence, and the response to homelessness even. But such behavior, in my opinion, is a denial of the gospel. While Jesus and Paul admonish us to be open and accepting of people, each of them, to reach out to them, each of us to reach out to them and introduce them to a life-changing, transforming relationship of life in Christ, 
we often repel the people for whom Jesus died. Paul reminds us Jesus lived and died for others. He writes, I took on the troubles of the troubled, is the way scripture puts it. Even if it was written in scripture long ago, you can be sure it's written for us. God wants the combination of his steady, constant calling and warm personal counsel in scripture to come to characterize us, keeping us alert for whatever he will do next. While the Reformation highlighted the church's corruption and diversity, it set free the opportunity for those new denominations. Now, while I recognize there are different personalities and interpretations of ancient texts and various ways that people worship because cultures are different, I do not believe the Reformation caused the problem. In my opinion, humble as it is, the split in churches is the result of sin. A result of sin in the church. The sin of putting personal preference and self-interest above that of our individual call to ministry. Let's take a walk with Jesus. Now imagine him walking into Pottstown today. What would Jesus think as he came into town and saw the perpetual proliferation of Christian churches. Over, over there, the Invictus Church, an African-American congregation, directly across from Trinity Reformed UCC. And the next block is Zion Lutheran. I'm sorry, Zion UCC, which dates back to the mid-1750s. Adjoining it, adjoining it right next door is Emmanuel Lutheran Church, once the largest congregation in its synod. It's an imposing brick and stained glass structure, celebrating its 252nd year. It used to be the rich people's church. This is where the old families, the town leaders, and, and the corporation executives would go to worship. It was known as the status church in town. The congregation doesn't do this intentionally, that is make it the status church, but everything about their church sends the message that you must be wealthy to feel comfortable there. Emmanuel's given up the stat that status of being the rich people's church to First Presbyterian Church. It moved out of town up to the north end several years ago. And there are more churches in the next block. Further up the corner of Beach and Hanover Street, St. Aloysius Catholic Church, the only true church, is directly across the street from the worship center, which is primarily an ethnic congregation. Now that's on one street alone. Downtown has at least three churches on Main Street. Christ Episcopal, the former United Methodist, which is now Mission First, it's an outreach center, an Assemblies of God church, and several ethnic language churches. There are churches all over town, up on Chicken Hill, at least that's what they still call it, up on Chicken Hill, Second Baptist Church serves primarily the neighborhood population, but it's been displaced by Bethel Community Church, an independent church now meeting in the synagogue with the Jewish congregation, and now, re most recently, First Baptist Church has moved into that building as well because it sold its downtown building to the YWCA. A few of them recognized each other and worked together, but alas, too few. This kind of segregation is not what Jesus, Paul, or Martin Luther had in mind. Paul certainly understands the nature of the church as one body. But centuries have passed, and the teaching of unity and service has often been set aside, particularly by aging mainline denominational congregations. It adds one more difference in the body of Christ. Class and age and greed divisions are now added to the division of color. 
It's been said that 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in America. And it saddens Jesus to see it. It's still true as he walks through our town. Finally, on an outlying road and the newest is the newest church in town, the fundamentalist Bible church, they won't have anything to do with the other churches because the fundamentalists think that they are the only true Christians, the only true Bible believers, and the only ones who are saved. As the fundamentalist Baptist church sees it, the other churches are the Antichrist. They're not to be associated with or they risk losing their immortal soul. Now, is that what Jesus meant when he said in Matthew 28, now you go in my authority and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to faithfully follow all that I have commanded you. Or as Luke records it in Jesus' final words in Acts 1.8, and you will be my messengers to Jerusalem throughout Judea and the distant provinces, even to the remotest places in the earth. Some of the older translations have it, even to the ends of the earth. Pastor Billy Strahan wrote about this. And, and here's, here's, let me share with you some of what he said because I think it's, it, it's really important. He says, unity isn't easy. Most of us have never learned how to disagree in love or how to love those with whom we disagree. We're like the poet who wrote, to dwell above with saints we love, that will be grace and glory. To live below with saints we know, well, that's a different story. Unity isn't easy, but Paul calls us to be united, to take care of each other. And Jesus prayed for it. And for, as a matter of fact, he modeled it for us. Remember when the disciples came to him complaining about the people preaching and doing signs and wonders in Jesus' name, but weren't part of the crowd of disciples? They were ready to run them out of town or call lightning on, the, on, on their heads. Jesus told the disciples not to stop them and said, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Christian unity is not determined by whether we agree about every interpretation of scripture, doctrine, or form of church government. Christian unity is determined by whether we love one another and reflect God's love in Christ for the world. I would add that Christian unity is about elevating Jesus and his call to love each other above all else. Friends, family, neighbors, and self. Let's pray. Gracious, loving God, as we conclude this sermon series, we remember the words of Paul when he wrote, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude toward each other that Christ had. Thank you for the wisdom and guidance of this letter of Paul. Help us live out these words in our daily lives. Grant us the strength to bear with one another in love, just as Christ bore our sins on the cross. Strengthen, strengthen and encourage us to be of one mind and voice in glorifying and serving you. Empower us to live out these directions so that we can glorify you and make your love known through us. Lord, may we never let our preferences and desires divert us from our complete dedication to you. And we pray this, Lord, in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. The hymn is number 590, Christ Loves the Church.
Would you stand? this message in your hearts as we leave this place ready to be servants of Christ and be united in worship. Now go forth, brothers and sisters, in the spirit of unity and love. May the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that hope may overflow from you by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessings of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and sustain you each day. Amen. Amen.